Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. This is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Remember, we are connecting thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and business experts to you, the small business owner. Really excited today to have my guest. She's the CEO and co-founder of Orem, Stephanie Kirkpatrick. Orem is a platform for frictionless financial movement, and they're specializing in smart, real-time, automated money movement. Today's, today's episode, we're going to talk to Stephanie about her background as a certified financial planner, as a serial entrepreneur, what led her to creating Orem. We will discuss the issues with the automated clearinghouse known as ACH with real-time money movement and the future of Orem and FinTech. We hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Stephanie, welcome to the Money Talks podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. It's like 75 and sunny in New York and I could not be happier. Oh, wow. That that's that's great news. Great to hear that the weather's so uh fantastic on the East Coast. I'm from the East Coast originally. I was actually just back there a week ago after uh not being on a plane for a long period of time, so that was interesting, but uh yeah, it's great to finally have some sense of normalcy and I'm sure it's even better for you guys to have a a, a nice taste of good weather so you can get outside. Anything that gets us outdoors makes me happy. And I'm happy that you got on an airplane. I still haven't done it. Last flight was February uh, of last year. So wow. it's been a long time for me. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that was right. Uh, right. Unfortunately, before the uh, unfortunate events began. But yeah, um, full flights uh, back and forth. I wasn't surprised. Uh, but everyone seemed to be behaving. Everyone was wearing right. their masks. Um, so that was good. So again, thank you. Really excited to connect with you. Um, again, as you just set off camera, congratulations on your recent capital raise and thank excited you. to really learn more about, you know, what you guys are working on and your background. So without further ado, maybe just we'll set the stage, talk a little bit about your background leading up to where you are now. Yeah. So it's such an interesting story because I think, uh, you know, as a certified financial planner, it is a bit unusual that I ended up in a tech company and now as a founder of a tech company. Um, but it's actually really core to who I am and what I care about. Um, you know, I'm the daughter of an immigrant who had very little when he came to America and was just raised in a household where thinking about our finances, my parents were small business owners, was sort of like a household conversation. And it inspired me to think about how could I play a part in my career and what I build and leaving the world better than I found it. And importantly, helping um, American households who have less have the opportunity to have more. And that led me to initially working at a company called Learn Best, where I spent, um, gosh, the last you know 10 years or so of my life um, building financial planning technology. And uh, we ended up getting acquired by Northwestern Mutual. And in that time, I got to see inside of a Fortune 100 company how the infrastructure was a challenge in terms of both innovation and frankly, the like friction in money in, money out, and money across that business. And so, uh, you know, the long and short of it is I still deeply obsess about how we make better financial outcomes. But now at Forum, I think about it from the perspective of infrastructure, because if we only built an app and tried to attract customers, we'd A, we'd have to pick who and we'd have to have a target persona. And by virtue of that, we'd probably be limiting ourselves and B. I think ultimately we'd cap out at maybe five, 10 million customers. And that's not enough. I really want to see fundamental impactful change in the entire system. Thank you for that. That, that, that was fantastic. It, that's one of the amazing things. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to have connected with yourself and other founders, especially in the fintech space. They're so, mo they're so moved, they're so motivated, and they're so caring about creating something to better everyone else's lives. It's such a it's such a humongous, it's the polar opposite, the difference of, I guess, the building blocks of what traditional finance in this country has created. <laughs> um, I being someone who spent 95% of his career working in large institutions, and only in the last couple of years, kind of making the transition to a, a smaller uh, boutique firm can really attest to a lot of these issues that, you know, inspire you to cre help create Orem or start Orem. So it's, it's really exciting to see that. And obviously we want to get into that. So let's, let's dive right into, you know, what you guys are working on and talk about, you know, you have these, you have two very exciting offerings or products that are at the forefront. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? 
Sure. Well, what you just described to you is, is really what I call founder's addiction, which is you're just addicted to the feeling of the, and the fear <laughs> of, of changing the system. And, and that is what gets you out of bed every day. Um, so at Orem, our mission is to build infrastructure for a frictionless financial system. And, and we kept it broad because it's not about the first two products that we're working on, although I'm going to tell you about those. And I think they're pretty big game changers. It's about the idea that we should be always thinking about how we make money smart real time and fully automated for consumers, for small businesses, for everybody. Um, and so what we're focused on today um, in sort of support of that vision and that mission is embeddable API products that can be used in today's financial system to make meaningful change without substantial upgrades to core systems in the back end of banks or significant technology overhaul. And um, really the, you know, the two products that we have today focus on solving very, very similar but different problems both in the landscape of money movement. So we have a $62 trillion money movement problem. Um, you know, the vast majority of what makes money move in the US is not credit cards, even though it feels like you swipe your card more than anything else. And certainly you use cash and even checks very infrequently, send wires very infrequently. What actually makes the world go around um, in terms of money in the US is ACH, right. a system built in the early 70s uh, and frankly built in an era in which you know, the core thesis was like banks are open nine to five, five days a week. Remember the innovation of like your bank being open on a Saturday till noon? I remember that. Remember the ATM being like, oh my God, I can get money at night? How fascinating. But of course, for a $3 fee. Um, and how we've changed as consumers since then in terms of our need for immediate availability of our money for a variety of reasons, whether that's access to our wages faster, same day, whether that's the ability to actually pay rent or pay our mortgage or pay something in real time so that the money's not in transit in limbo, not earning in my account and not where it needs to be. Um, and so, you know, we're really deeply obsessed in our two products with taking that friction out. In the ACH world, we think a lot about real time risk management and ACH intelligence at the transaction level. So Foresight, which is our debut product, right. is designed to do exactly that, right? It's to say, well, why does ACH move slowly? It's because data and information about the transaction move separate from the transaction itself. And the best tool we found to mitigate risk was to hold money for three days to find out if there was going to be funds available. Well, wouldn't it be better, just like your credit card swipe, to say, well, at the time of the transaction, do we think there's going to be funds available? And then more importantly, outside of settlement, which is three days later, right. in the next 60 days where the customer can still say, hey, it wasn't me, do we think there's going to be a return that's fraudulent? And by using machine learning, which has come such a long way in terms of what's possible, we're able to do that. And we're able to say when the transaction is initiated, what we think the probability of return is so that we can cut fraud by 50%, reduce NSFs, non-sufficient funds, returns by 40%. And importantly, so we can unlock the low probability return transactions to be credited provisionally to customer accounts instantly. And then in parallel, uh, we think it's important not only to have real-time risk management on ACH, but actually to move the money. And so we've built a platform called Momentum, which right. I always describe as, you know, momentum is to money movement what Amazon is to same-day delivery. You don't care if it came FedEx or DHL or UPS. The seller doesn't care either, but Amazon cares because they're optimizing for speed, for cost, uh, for the day of the week it's going to get to you, where you live. That's how we think about moving money. Anybody today who is building an app that should move money um, or who is already moving money should never have to think about individually integrating to each set of rail right. um, and then having to use tech resources to create the framework for de decisioning and let alone not even having the most optimal price on those rails. What you should do, which is what we've built, is integrate to our platform and abstract all of those choices. The SLA for speed, risk or cost, day of the week, things like that can be set at the enterprise level. And then we, Orem, are responsible for routing through the right bank for processing, managing which set of rails makes sense to push and to pull funds in a way that's fully optimized and future-proof. Because as we're starting to see people get excited, not only about real-time payments in FedNow, but super excited today, obviously, about crypto and Bitcoin and blockchain, you don't want to have to think about that as yet another separate thing or the card rails. That's everything in the back end of Orem. And our job is to be on the bleeding edge of Rails access so that the constant ability to optimize is always built into the system. So that's what we're up to. Yeah, the, thank you for that. That was an excellent uh, education and, uh, and information on what you guys are working on. And thank you for, you, you, you uh, 
you read my mind as far as wanting to discuss ACH because that's obviously a, a topic that, you know, people, if you said it to them, like what's, you know, most people probably would have some knowledge of it, but don't really understand its inner workings and sure and surely couldn't explain why it takes so long from someone like me, if I were to ACH money to, to you, that it would take, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours for you to get it. And once people start questioning that, they're like, well, why does it take so long for me to do that when I can, you know, swipe my card and, you know, on Amazon or, or order an Uber or whatever that happens, you know, like this, why can't the same thing be happen with money movement? So thank you for the, you know, explaining to everybody or the audience, you know, how this, the inner workings are, have been set and what you've done here to try to help, you know, create this amazing solution to a problem, like you said, is in the multi-trillions that were, that we've been confronted with. It is. And what's funny and fascinating is that once you tell someone, a lay person who's not from payments, doesn't move money, once you expose the problem, like you think about, okay, I just paid off my credit card on Sunday, but I actually don't have access to that available credit right. for four or five more days because of processing times, because of weekends, but I also don't have it in my bank account to spend either. Then you go, I can't unsee this, right? Once I've seen it as a consumer, I can't unsee it. Right. And it's, I think for all the listeners today, it's going to be something where like you have a big aha that, that this is actually broken. It is actually underserving you. And what's happened is that we've gotten so accustomed to that's how it works. And we've gotten right. accustomed to the fact that if in fact uh, the money is going to, you know, be unavailable for non-sufficient funds, I, the consumer will just pay fees for that. So banks are actually reaping rewards of this slow yeah. system um, to the tune of $11 billion in overdraft fees and things that are frankly, predatory, um, but because there's such a standard way of earning money and doing business, everyone's just gotten used to it. Um, so I think it's time, like you said, to think about, well, if I can get an Uber on demand, um, if I can literally see news breaking by the minute, if I can get a massage on demand in my apartment via an app <laughs> in under an hour, why does it take five days for my money to go from checking to my investment account or to my credit card for spending power? Um, why, if I am eligible for um, you know, reimbursement for, let's say, an auto insurance claim, am I going to have to wait to have access to that money? Why do I wait every two weeks to get paid? You just start to ask really big questions once you've seen the problem. And that is actually kind of how I got obsessed with it is as a financial planner wanting to understand why did I have so many people not want to put money in emergency savings in a separate high yield account? It's math, the math is obvious. It'll earn, you know, 1% more. Why wouldn't you? Oh, because you can't get it back on a weekend if there's an emergency and you're, you're afraid of that. So it's actually not just the fees, that friction leads people to actually never doing the thing that's right. good for them in the first place. So, you know, you wake up as a CFP and realize you're solving a payments problem because you still care about how people actually interact with their money. And I just, I can't shake that impact. Yeah. I was just, I was actually going to ask you earlier, you know, kind of what was the light bulb moment, I guess for you when you're, I guess, maybe in your mind starting to contemplate what Orm is becoming. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you just said it, which is the, this concept of people, you know, wanting to having to set up this emergency liquid savings account to earn some more interest on it, but yet you can't have access to it. That's right. Yeah. As a financial planner, listen, I was building, um, you know, patented technology for LearnVest. And, you know, I just wanted the easy button. Everybody says, yes, of course they want to, you know, refinance my student loan or pay it off faster. Of course I want to get ahead of credit card debt. Of course I want to invest for retirement or save for my wedding or any other number of things, emergency saving. Can you do it for me? And the old version of that would be like, sure, as a brokerage firm, we could take AUM, asset center management, and I'll manage your portfolio. But that's leaving like 99% of your financial life basically up to you. And I wanted to build the easy button. I wanted to just have the implement choice, right? Um, no matter where you're getting the advice, which advice is now fairly commoditized, right. um, which I'm grateful for, um, I, I want you to be able to just say, go. And that's when I really had the major aha that you can't do that if you can't make it move instantly because where it's going, how it's going to get there, all of that matters in the decision. And what I think will be true in the next three to five years, um, maybe sooner, uh, based on what we're building, is that these first two pillars, these two products, momentum and foresight, they unlock the next chapter of being able to build the orchestration layer to know what to automate, when and how, and customers can just say yes through their banking apps or their investment apps. 
if my account's ever over $2,000, automatically move $500 or a percent of what's in here to these five places. And they're always different because the priority or parameter or value is changing. Right. If I spend more than $500 on a credit card, start $10 a day auto repayment. You know, things that of course make mathematical sense. I learned very early that the financially optimized, like mathematically optimized and the emotionally optimized path are very different because as humans, we're left to solve it by ourselves and we end up defaulting to doing nothing. So, um, you know, that, that was really the aha is that it, the system is, is actually working backwards um, yeah. to how it should be working and that we needed to change some of the underpinnings to be able to get to what I think is chapter two um, in personal finance, which is self-driving money. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, what you, again, I can't, you know, kudos to you and for, for everything you were working on and working toward that's really exciting. You know, I've been very fortunate to interview on my podcast, several different, several founders in the last four or five months in the FinTech space. And, you know, you have this great energy, you all want to help. It's, you know, you're extremely good natured people who really want to make a difference. And it's amazing. Like, you know, everyone kind of talks about this entrepreneurial spirit and it seems like it's really been, you know, rejuvenated in this country. Now we all want to forget what happened a year ago, but as I've said, just on my podcast, I've learned there's so much good that is happening that has, you know, been happening because or in spite of, or because of what, what, you know, happened last year, that there's a lot of amazing you know, things in front of us that can really help, help the individual, help the business owner, you know, immensely going forward. Well, you did see people really come together. There's something like a good crisis to right. remind us, you know, what we're capable of and where we care and where passions lie. And I think, you know, for many entrepreneurs, myself, especially the passion lies beyond just building a cool product or changing some aspect of the system. It's also been really amazing looking back at this last year to say, we now have 45 people in 11 states because we got an opportunity to build a remote first company that would have otherwise seemed crazy and unrealistic. And we would have had to beg people to try it. And the whole world went there. We're going to stay here. And what that's unlocking is not only just an extraordinary amount of diversity, right? Greater than 50% of the team identifies as female, more than 50% identify as non-white, just really like cool, interesting people. Um, it also means lots of parents are working at a company at like a series A, which is no, not normal, right? Um, but it's been a great enabler for myself as the founder to um, kiss my kids goodnight every night. Like I said, I haven't been on an airplane in more than 400 days, which is wild. Um, I was, you know, flying 250,000 miles a year before that. Wow. Um, but it's really this opportunity to build not just a next gen product, but a next gen company that supersedes the moment in time that we found ourselves in. And um, that is actually, I think, one of the, the most interesting things as we build forward um, and, and making sure that tech companies aren't exclusive to high cost cities, that access to incredible career paths for underserved, underrepresented communities doesn't have to be about locale. Um, and that if you have, you know, you're sitting in, in anywhere, wherever you are today, in whatever state, um, you know, you can be a part of what we're building and you don't have to relocate to make that happen. It's just been really cool. Yeah, that's a, a, an amazing value proposition, you know, talking about what you were able to do under obviously, you know, under duress, you know, not in one location in, and being able to, you know, be so inclusive and be able to, you know, create all this and do this spread out throughout the country and be able to communicate and really succeed it is, a, is amazing. It's a testament to what you, you know, your vision and your value proposition and wanting to build this. And that's the other thing that I've learned from interviewing these founders, especially in FinTech is this really, this need to want to build a, a great culture that mm -hmm. that's essential to uh, any future in a company, no matter how great the product is or the market opportunity, you have to have that culture. We do. And the culture is, is based on four values that we live and breathe every day. We talk about them obsessively, um, show up with curiosity, lead with good vibes and good intentions. Owners get things done, done, done. And every one of us is an owner of Orem. And diversity of thought can only be had by having diversity of people. And so you know, the best ideas are not going to be ones I had. Sure, we discovered the problem. But the avenue to solving it, to continuing to improve on the features of the existing products and build new lines of business, 
that will come from all of the different folks that we've invited in to participate in setting strategy and thinking about where we should go next and why. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's an honor to lead such a diverse and sort of thriving company in a time in which, um, you know, you feel like anything is possible because you're, you're at the very beginning of writing the chapter for Orem uh, that leads to what we're going to be when we grow up. And I think we're, we're all, we're all really excited to be the pioneers to make remote work for the long run our thing. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I do think going in person will be great too, but right. it's the right thing for us. And so we're fully embracing it. That, that's fantastic. So let, let me ask you, you know, you're obviously you're, you, you've devised this, you know, incredible, these incredible products and you have this, this, this vision. Are you seeing um, res, kind of resistance? I mean, traditional finance is essentially under assault right now, whether it's, you know, digital assets, neobanks, you name it, you know, fintech is, is exploding and it's essentially coming after, you know, like we joked earlier about, you know, the ATM and all of these things that we've become so accustomed to. Do you, have you seen any resistance, you know, from potential clients as far as what you're working on and working towards? So we don't see resistance, but we do see um, challenge in particularly in banks to be ready for this next chapter. And, you know, real-time payments, RTP, um, which was pioneered by the Clearinghouse, which is owned by the top eight banks, um, it was designed in 2017, rolled out in 2019, and the adoption of it is still quite low, not because we aren't excited about real-time payments, right? But because to upgrade a core system, to get to real-time ledgering, to get to real-time reconciliation and real-time gross settlement, and then real-time operations, right? Banks are closed at night and on the weekends. But if money moves at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday and there's a problem, who are you going to call? Right. So what we discovered in you know thinking about how we solve this problem is that Momentum, our money movement platform, can't just say we have RTP in the arsenal. We actually have to build for all of those things so that when we go into banks, we can say, listen, we make you ready, right? Our real-time ledgering system, which is proprietary, we built it ourselves, will reconcile with your batch-based system in the morning so you don't have to change the way that works. Um, there's a hookup required, but it's simple. Um, you know, you can white label from us services that otherwise today you're left to design by yourself. So we thought a lot about what creates traction. It's not just, you know, claiming, stating customers need money instantly. I mean, we think we all agree on that point. It's readying our partners and helping guide them to the ability to be able to pull this off. And the more we pull into our platform and streamline, the better that ability is to get into market in places where um, adoption of new, you know, net new things is, is challenging. If you look at the banking landscape, you know, we have 5,000 community banks who super serve a hyper local right. regional population. And, you know, those aren't big cities. That isn't New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Like that's, you know, small towns in Iowa. That's like where our farm and small community culture is. And if we fail to bring the innovation to the small guys just because they can't afford to do it or can't manage it, we've, we've failed in our entire vision. So we think a lot about how integrating a, with us will be straightforward. I'm never going to say easy because nothing is easy. Straightforward and focused on providing um, all of the sort of other moving pieces that connect right. into not just Rails access, but full optimization. Yeah, that's those, that's a really important point you just you were just discussing about how this needs to be. This isn't just about, you know, the larger cities, or even mid-tier cities. It's about making this available to, you know, you know, community banks, as you just Absolutely. noting across the country. Um, and that's, that's, that's amazing. Obviously look forward to, to continue watching this build and grow. So I always uh, kind of towards the, towards the end of the podcast, I always like to give the guests an opportunity to take the mic away from me and ask, and ask me a question because they're so kind to be here, you know, obviously spending their time and answering all my questions. So I turn around and the, the mic goes to you. Well, my question is probably not the hardest question you've ever had, but hopefully a fun one. I would love to know, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh, I uh, thank you for that. I, yeah, yesterday, I definitely had my most difficult question. Uh, it was a great podcast, uh, but it is a supremely difficult question. Uh, favorite flavor of ice cream? Wow. Um, great question. Uh, I'm going to have to say chocolate. I mean, I, I, Haagen-Dazs chocolate is 
is probably the go-to, even though I try to go to a lot, a lot less than I used to. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that would be it. Very simple. I mean, now, nowadays there's so many flavors of ice cream out there. Uh, it's, it's kind of crazy, but I'll, I'll stick to that traditional flavor. I like that you're keeping it simple. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, I try to stay stay away from that part of the uh, supermarket aisle now because it's it's kind of crazy uh, the amount of choices we now have <laughs> and the cost. <laughs> the cost is incredible. I'm a big believer in small batch ice cream, and I have some favorite flavors and brands. And I get to the checkout, and I'm like, twelve dollars a pint? Yeah, wow, right? But I I will say it's my big vice, which is why I had to know what flavor and uh, <laughs> get the details. Well, I, I appreciate that that question. It was it was a it was a lot uh, easier than some of the ones I've had in the past. But thank you for that. Um, so as a, every time I conclude my episodes, I always like to ask the guests for you know one piece of actionable advice for other entrepreneurs. You know, again, I'm super grateful that you could spend time with us today and learn you know learn more about your product. You know, that's why I started the podcast over a year ago it was essentially find, you know, entrepreneurs and experts to help, you know, with actual advice to other business owners and help educate. Because to me, this is such an important space, especially specifically fintech, because there's so much going on, so much that can help other entrepreneurs and, and other families really better themselves. But it's hard because there's so much information and they don't know how to learn and understand. It, and that's, you know, why I did this. So if you have one last piece of advice for entrepreneurs, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Can I give three quick things? Okay. Please. Um, so the first thing is strong convictions loosely held. I do think that uh, much like myself, I, I knew I wanted to solve how money movement, I wanted to solve a, a big problem, um, but it took a minute to find how and, and to really like work out the thesis. And so I think, you know, after a period of time of testing with customers, listening to the market, talking to investors, you know, just be prepared to continuously evolve how you're super serving your audience and thinking about the actual solution to the problem that you want to solve. Um, and then I think importantly, um, take care of yourself. Yeah. Yes. Like I, I know people who listen to me talk all the time. I talk about sleep a lot because first of all, I'm getting older um, and I have a kid, so I need it. But second of all, I'm not my best self on four hours of sleep. I'm just not. Could I do it? Sure. You're not your best self on four hours of sleep either. And so take care of yourself, get outside, exercise, breathe fresh air, because you're going to have that aha on a run or while you're doing yoga, not while you're like pounding the keyboard, Right. eat healthy, sleep and hydrate. Um, and then the last thing is to ask for help, surround yourself with investors, angels, advisors, fellow founders, and raise your hand. If you're having a hard time hiring engineers, ask for help. If you don't know a you know regulatory aspect, like phone a friend. If you're just not sure how to think about marketing or any other thing, I literally ask for help all the time. And I think people are afraid to admit they don't know. Right. And I think the fastest way to learn and get around a corner and like see a blind spot is to ask someone who's done it before. Um, so those are my three pro tips uh, to all the founders out there listening today. Thank you, Stephanie. That that was great, especially number three. I think I'm sure there are numerous entrepreneurs out there and founders that you know don't do what you just advised them to do, which is ask for help. You know, you can't possibly. There's aren't. I'm sure there's no founders that have been you know wildly wildly successful and have gone public and have made you know un, you know ungodly sums of money who didn't ask for help, who didn't have great partners with them, who didn't raise their hand. It's just, it's not possible for you to do it all by yourself. So that's exactly right. It's literally not possible. And the people around you, they've seen the playbook. They know how, you know, the specialty of, you know, enterprise SaaS sales should look and you don't. So just ask and, and, and realize once you do ask, you'll see how much the people backing you and around you want you to win and how hard yeah. they're going to work for you to get you in front of the right person to teach and educate you on the things that you need. So um, hopefully good advice to everyone as they're thinking about this journey themselves. hundred percent. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here today. I learned a ton. I know the audience will learn a ton, you know, want to stay connected to you, excited to follow, you know, your progress and your team at Orem and wish you all the best going forward. Thank you. If you're looking for opportunities and you love money movement, orum.io, check us out. Absolutely. I will def we'll definitely stay on top of that. Stephanie, thank you again for being here today. 
We'll be back next week with another episode of Money Talks. Remember, if you had time to subscribe and like our YouTube channel, we'll be back again next week. Again, this is Hugh Meyer and this is Money Talks. Take care.